Warm holiday greetings from Palo Alto, California. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of the StorageX Initiative and together with Professor Yi Tui, uh, we're really pleased to welcome you to the final seminar of 2022 uh, from a frosty, um, frosty Stanford campus. So for our final seminar um, of the quarter end of the year, uh, we're going to be focused on the theme of aqueous energy storage and conversion. Um, we have covered a lot of um, lithium-ion batteries and beyond lithium-ion battery technologies. Um, aqueous energy storage is both past, present, and also the future uh, of energy storage. Um, we are delighted to have two great speakers. Um, Deborah Rollison from the um, Naval Research Lab and uh, Veronica Augustine, Professor of Material Science and Engineering from North Carolina State, to talk about the latest in terms of academic and fundamental understanding and spending all the way to technology development and device optimization for next generation energy storage um, based on uh, aqueous electrolytes. So just a few words for me on aqueous energy storage. It's a, a fascinating topic um, because this is really where um, the combinations of scalability, uh, manufacturability, performance, energy density, power density can all potentially come together, but yet not all of them are achieved simultaneously today. So there's huge opportunities for understanding what are the underlying design rules to improve these further, um, and also a lot of room for technology development. And I will leave uh, our first speaker, uh, Deborah, to introduce this uh, a little bit further to the state of the field. Uh, so let me ask uh, Deborah to join us uh, here on the screen. Unfortunately, uh, she will not be sharing her video today. Um, so let me start with an introduction. So Deborah, as I mentioned, uh, is the head of um, the electrochemical material section of the Naval Research Lab. She is a highly distinguished uh, electrochemist. She's the fellow of AAAS, MRS, and ACS, uh, and has been a leader in electrochemical, um, uh, aqueous electrochemistry for many decades. And she has received so many awards, I can only list a few. Uh, among them is the EO Hulbert Award, which is the top um, award offered by the Navy uh, at the Naval Research Lab. She has received uh, the Division of uh, Analytical Chemistry Award uh, from the ACS, the American Chemical Society, the Riley Award from the Electroanalytical um, um, Chemistry um, Society, and the ACO, ACS Award for the Chemistry of Material, and the Hilbrand Prize um, from ACS, from the Chemical Society of Washington. We are so delighted, Deborah, to have you speak to us and uh, anchor our seminar series for 2022. And we look forward to hearing more about aqueous electrochemistry and its connection to energy storage technology. Deborah? Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Am I coming through? You are loud and clear. Great. Before I dive into you know, facts and figures and graphics, I'd like to acknowledge this is very much a team effort. Uh, you'll see Jeff Long, Joe Parker, Megan Sasson, Chris Churvin, Paul Vasario, all postdocs with me over the years who were hired in as staff scientists at NRL and with whom I still uh, collaborate. We slosh around as we need to. For your uh, faculty's information, Joe Parker is now the uh, program manager in charge of expeditionary power and energy at ONR, Office of Naval Research. And today is Chris Churvin's last day at NRL because he's about to leave to head materials chemistry in basic energy sciences at DOE. And below you'll see two of our, our recent crop of postdocs, Travis Novak and Ryan DeBlock, whom I'm about to hire. So many moons ago, you can see the date up there, 1999, ONR ran a grand challenges workshop, lots of fun. They wanted uh, out there discussions and ideas where to particularly drive energy storage. And I came up with the concept that I call colors of capacitance, and I'm gonna use uh, Yuri Gagatsi's very nice uh, graphic to demonstrate that. So there's the one we're used to where we've got typically a liquid electrolyte, we've got an anode and a cathode, we've got a positive cathode, a negative anode, there's an excess and deficit of electrons at those surfaces and the ions 
that are mobile come up and balance that. So it looks a lot like a dielectric capacitor. And in this way to store energy, which is a very, again, a very old science, you uh, typically want as much electrifiable interface as you can get away with. And that's why people often are using activated carbons in commercial electrochemical capacitors sold as supercapacitors. But there was a recognition, again, sort of in the, the 90s, particularly with ruthenium dioxide, Yuri's example is manganese oxide, is that there is a surface-sided Faradaic redox reaction where there is a change in the redox state. You're not expecting the carbon to change its redox state in the EDL system. But it looks a lot like a classic capacitor in terms of current voltage, and I'll show you that in a second. So the pseudocapacitance mechanism was recognized as another way to store energy. And then, of course, the classic, if you will, lithium ion battery, where not only is the Faradaic reaction occurring, but ions have to insert into crystallographic orientations to create the stored electron um, ionic charge in the system. So you can consider these three, if you will, colors of capacity. That way we can store energy in a two electrode or two terminal device. But as we started working with uh, nanoscale materials, particularly ultra porous nanoscale materials done by Veronica's PhD advisor, Bruce Dunn, uh, Bill Smurl at Minnesota, our group when we came into it in sort of the late 90s, is that if you can think architecturally, you're really emphasizing different colors in terms of the performance of the material in a two terminal device. So in terms of pattern recognition, looking at current on the Y, potential on the X, if you've got just the charge you're storing at the electrifiable, in this case, carbon entrance, you get this envelope, this very dull, boring, nothing's going on. Now, pseudocapacitance looks a lot like that envelope, but there's always more current if you will, per gram after you've normalized. And you get a hint that, yeah, there might be something Faraday going on at the ends and occasionally in the middle. And a true battery gives us thermodynamic peaks that relate to where is the change in the redox center in the active material. So time scales matter. There's that pattern recognition event of what the current voltage curves looks like. Um, supercapacitors can give you hundreds of thousands of cycles because you're not changing much physically, it's just going to the surface. The Faradaic reactions are involved and you have to worry about the efficiency, the Coulombic recovery, charge discharge. What is surface if you've got a porous system versus anomaly, something that's tens of microns, the electrons and ions have to get into and out of. And what happens if you think in terms of nanostructuring or architectural design? And we, backed into this because we were trying to understand the pseudocapacitive champ, hydrous ruthenium oxide. And the, the fun thing about that material, RuO2, is rutile crystalline electronic conductivity approaching that of copper, not a very good pseudocapacitor. But if you start to put hydrous character into it, you can really store charge. And the odd thing was that in the 80s and 90s, people thought um, it was metallic, even with 2.5 moles of water in the chemical formula. That never made sense to me. So as we were studying it more as a catalyst than as an energy storage system, we did a pair distribution functional analysis in collaboration with uh, Wojciech um, Damowski and Tageshi Egami. And that showed, regardless of what the water was in that chemical formula, bone dry to two point, I think we had 2.3 moles of water, you had a network for the electrons, the crystalline rutile, which was so small, it was hard to see by standard powder X-ray diffraction. And another phase that was mapping onto those electron conductive surfaces that was protonic. So you had two transport network, networks in this system that was creating on its own the world's best pseudocapacitive energy storage material. I like to think of it as an analog to dye block copolymers. So you have the classic path for the electrons. You've got a pass for the protons that's running right along that surface. And that picture, it's never been a homogeneous material, changes how you think about designing what you need to put into almost any electrochemical device. You need transport paths for electrons back to some macroscopic current collector that's gonna go through a load and then talk to the other electrode. 
and a path for ions to move. So our way to classically make an energy storing two terminal device, regardless of what the materials are or the electrolyte is, is you've typically got an active material in red here that's not a great electron conductor. You mix it in with something that helps you move an electron, so what I call an ad hoc electron wire, which is typically a conductive carbon powder. And to keep those powders together, you often have to put in polymer binders. So as we recognize what ruthenia as a pseudocapacitor was teaching us, we wanted to think about how do we wire electrons and ions. So we may still have a macro scale electrical contact, but we want, if you will, a architected volume of uh, where the current is always going to be able to go rapidly back to that macro scale contact and some kind of modification of that. And now ultimately filling up somewhat so you've got um, the active material quantity you need in terms of per gram of electrode or per square area, if you're thinking of aerial, and paths to move ions. So now we're thinking about, I need to wire electrons, I need to wire ions, I need to wire molecules to really get current. And I need a lot of area, so I've got enough, if you will, mass to store energy. Those two things need to be distinct. So if you're looking at a more bird's eye view, you've got your macro scale current collector we can't see anymore. We've got our black sort of architected current collector, a redox active coating, and we're talking to where the ions and electrons need to live with short distances. You notice that scale bar, tens of nanometers, not tens of microns as in a classic battery material. So in my view, coming out of Royce Murray's group at North Carolina, we're right back to chemically modified electrodes where you had a conductive, typically planar surface that you were monomolecularly modifying or putting a polymer on, only you had, you know, at most a square centimeter. So we're now trying to do electroanalysis in three dimensions and with hundreds to thousands of square centimeters of electrifiable area per cross-sectional footprint. So that gives you, um, as an analytical chemist, I like to have a big signal. It gives you a lot of things to understand. But we still have some key questions where a lot of work needs to be done. And our group can dip into this periodically. We have to sell programs and sometimes they can't look too applied. But we are talking to carbon for the most case in a practical battery world. And carbon is not the best electron transfer interface in terms of your heterogeneous electron transfer rate constant. But we're living with carbon because it's cheap and we can do a lot of fun things with it. So if you're worried about energy and power, ultimately you have to think about what is my heterogeneous electron handoff between the active material and the carbon. And we're still not doing that particularly well because we're working with carbon. So I'll leave that as an open question. So if we think, Architecturally, if we think we need to wire ions, we need to wire molecules, we need to wire our electrons to actually do something, architecture is one way to think about it. And as we studied this more and more, it became obvious once you've got that kind of control over a lot of electrifiable interface, you're building in control of interfacial morphology. And that's often what trips up the long life cycling you'd like out of a practical system like a battery. And I'm going to give you a touch on some of these examples. Fortunately, Kaylee informed me Monday I had a 30-minute talk, so I threw out a lot of stuff. So touching on some of these topics will ensue. So let's talk about carbon that could be an architecture and talk back to a macro scale contact. We've come out of a lot of our understanding through aerogel science, which is a whole series of talks on its own, but there is a polymer, an organic sol gel process that gives you a polymer nanofoam that you can pyrolyze to make a reasonably conductive carbon. And rather than put it in a standard uh, jello mold, in this case a jello mold for us is carbon fiber paper. So rather than trying to span across a centimeter or a meter, because sol gel science is very scalable, our mold is going to be carbon fiber paper. So here's a carbon fiber that you can see, and you can see the high quality adhesion of our pyrolyzed polymer nanofoam there. Now, the fun thing about sol gel science, it gives you a way to map different pore size ranges that's co-continuous with that solid carbon. Because we're in paper, we can stack it, one ply, two ply, three ply. We've done up to six ply. At that point, it's very much a macroscopic object. 
not even flexible, whereas one ply is still flexible. You've got that XY just because of the size of the paper you cut out and you can ply it in Z. And the important thing for us is the void is co-continuous with that solid carbon foamy network. So we've already put in the things we need to move molecules around. And let's just increase our, our uh, magnification. So we've gone to two to one micron. We're not seeing the carbon fiber anymore. Here's 200 nanometers. And so what you're seeing here is a massively parallel 3D current collector. And that's kind of our starting point for a lot of what we've done over the years in terms of electrochemical capacitors and battery materials and even catalysis. And we like those cross ties and I beams because it's much more mechanically rugged. So you're in California, you know that if you've got a lot of pillars standing up next to each other and an earthquake comes, your, your mechanics are going to be very bad news. You collapse your structure. So we think in 3D and the nice thing about this is it's ready to go into your Electra. We don't make an exotic carbon and modify it and then grind it back up with carbon powder to me that is a colossal waste of time and taxpayer dollars. So we've got nanofoam filled paper, which is an object itself, but only so interesting because it's carbon. So we're gonna dip it into an oxidant solution like aqueous permanganate. And if we've controlled what we need to control, and that's usually temperature and pH, what comes out looks as though it's unchanged. But if you go into your transmission electron microscope, you can see the, um, manganese oxide fibrils everywhere. Occasionally you catch them sort of edge on and you can see the layered MnO6 octahedral planes characteristic of um, burnicite MnO2. Now the important thing about doing it this way is most manganese oxides are rocks. They're not great electron conductors. And carbon is our starting point for our two terminal devices. So it's got reasonable electronic conductivity. So if you're slathering a poor electron conductor on top of a good electron conductor, yeah, you do have to grind it back up and mix it with carbon. But if you're painting the surface of your good conductor, as we do when we electrolysely deposit the manganese oxide, as the permanganate sacrificially oxidizes that carbon layer, you get nanoscale deposits over your high surface area electrifiable interface. So we take something that's typically on the order of tens to a few hundred uh, Siemens per centimeter conductor. And we're just putting a really thin layer of something that's six, seven orders of magnitude less electronically conductive. So we don't have a huge ohmic uh, concern in this system. And the important thing about doing it with this controlled, if you will, painting is that you're not carpeting the boundary of the paper with thick manganese oxide. And that allows you to design in the pore structure that designs in your frequency response, and now you've added a, a more interesting redox flavored system on top of this um, carbon fiber paper. So Megan Sasson uh, took a one ply, two ply, three ply system, cross sectioned it, looked at it in the microscope with the manganese oxide on there. And again, we're gonna stay aqueous. So we're either going to be something like a sodium sulfate or a lithium sulfate, a mild electrolyte, not strongly acidic or basic. And so in a sodium sulfate system, you're potentially inserting sodium. And if you've got water around, you always have to remember proton is uh, often the preferred uh, insertion ion. And so she did the voltammetry on that, current voltage curve, nice uh, envelope, and normalized to 2.6 farads of stored energy per square centimeter. Two-ply cross-section, you can see the good fill factor, doubled, went to five. Three-ply, we're now three times that. And that told us we had good connectivity of that void across a large macro-scale distance. So you can see the three-ply here is over 200 microns thick. And from your pattern recognition, you can see how boring just the plain carbon nanofoam paper is at a one-ply. And then we've painted it with manganese oxide, two-ply, three-ply. Our current is now the capacitance normalized to the area of the system. We can also look at it as normalized to the mass of MnO2. And as you would expect, if we've got this kind of control, the per mass comes out to the same number because we've got, if you will, three plies, much more thickness on a per gram basis. You've upped it, but per gram, it looks identical. So for particularly for aerial uh, footprint 
uh, specific applications, this is the kind of control you want. You want to build up as a skyscraper, but still have control of the ions, the electrons, and the molecules. But there's other fun things you can do with this lamellar burnicite like So we've got sodium between our layers and water, of course. We're not showing the water. That gives us a certain um, milliamp hours per gram. Now I'm dividing by the total weight of the electrode. That's another point that uh, makes us growl at our laboratory because most people won't tell you what they're normalizing to. We always tell you what we normalize to. And in that uh, sort of yellow um, font, this is telling you the um, oxidation state of the manganese. So it's not all four plus. And typically this painting in the high surface area on a carbon surface across the literature is giving you roughly 0.3 electrons per manganese center, which is, you know, pathetic. So Megan exchanged the sodium in the inner layers for lithium, just aqueous soak and lithium nitrate. Now we've got a lithiated system and essentially the same footprint because it really should be 29 milliamp hours per gram total electrode. We've uh, lowered the amount of manganese four in the system a bit with the lithium, but you can see it's giving you roughly the same performance in this lithium sulfate aqueous electrolyte. But you can convert that layered manganese oxide form to something much more interesting, more like a battery material. So first they treated in argon at 300 C. And you can see we're starting to you know, kind of roughen the surface a bit. We very much lowered the oxidation state closer to all of it being manganese three. And you start to see things that pop up that look like a Faradayk response that you'd expect for something that's probably like an MN203. But if you give it a little bit of air at a lower temperature, so you're not oxidizing the carbon, you crystallize that paint that was originally layered into a lithium spinel. And now you've got the beautiful battery response you'd expect for an intercalating system. And the reason Megan and Jeff were really focused on this is putting a lot more charge in the positive end of the spectrum. They would then pair this system with a rust painted uh, carbon fiber paper and have its own doubly asymmetric electrochemical capacitor. And that can give you uh, approaching two volts in an aqueous system because both electrodes are suppressing either uh, water oxidation or water reduction. And you can see now you've upped the total uh, milliamp hours per gram of the electrode. And this one is giving us a full electron per manganese. So this is one of the hints that carbon cares literally what the molecular atomic orbital arrangement is as you're handing off electrons. The burnicite 0.3 if you sort of aligned where that uh, now tall <laughs> compared to the layered form uh, skyscraper of the spinel is, now we're getting our full electron. And people have studied the lithium spinel as a battery material and in aqueous lithium sulfate. So here's uh, one paper that came out um, last decade, grounded up with carbon powder. And you can see if they're going sort of well, battery slow, 0.3 millivolts per second, you can see some resolution of those Faradayic peaks. But once you're at a millivolt per second, you know, you've lost that resolution. And then this, this is a classic powder composite. But if you're doing what we do, where we've converted the burnicite to uh, roughly 10 nanometer thick lithium spinel, you've got that resolution even up to 25 millivolts per second. So you can be 80 times faster in terms of accessing those electrons if you take the same material and architecturally design it. So that's typically what we want in the modern era. Yes, we want energy and lots of it so we don't have to charge our battery too often, but you also want power out of it in terms of modern devices. And classic powder composites are really hard to get powder out, power out without uh, compromising the chemomechanical characteristics of the active material. When you're only 10 nanometers thick, you really don't have to worry about it. But there's other things you can do with burnicite. So maybe six, seven years ago, people said, well, why don't I take out those, you know, boring sodiums or potassiums between the layers and have divalent zinc in there, the start of the zinc ion battery. So you're in a mild electrolyte, often a lithium sulfate aqueous system versus zinc foil. And you're going to try to charge and discharge that burnicite. So, you know, we're coming in with now our burnicite on carbon nanofoam, not the powder composite almost everybody else in the world studies. 
And we wanted to play games because we knew this was a highly pseudocapacitive system. So we're gonna start with our kind of Carolina blue all zinc sulfate in the electrolyte or all sodium sulfate. So this should be acting like a battery. This should be acting like a pseudocapacitive type system. And in between, we blend the electrolytes, but we did it so we had the same ionic strength all the way through. So that wasn't a confounding variable as we studied the electrochemistry. And again, here's our pattern recognition, um, normalized current across the voltage versus sink and the Carolina blue battery-like all zinc sulfate, the black sodium sulfate, again, our capacitive envelope and blending the sodium and zinc and the electrolyte gives us something in between. Let's look at that a little more closely. So people in the battery world for too long now have been using um, a deconvolution of that current voltage curve, assigning the um, surface-sided pseudocapacitive-like to a linear sweep rate, that's the K1 nu, plus the more semi-infinite diffusion for ions that would have to go into the solid state as in a classic battery. And so you'll see um, the voltammetric curve you see deconvolved to how much of it's capacitive, how much of it is um, battery storage. So this is a very sodium rich, so it should be mostly pseudocapacitive. So, okay, here's um, less sodium, more zinc, it starts to look a little bit like a dinosaur. Here's 50-50 and here's all battery. So yes, your response should be to shudder. Uh, we are vehemently opposed to this analysis of um, charge storing materials in a, either a half cell or a full cell, because as your eye can tell you, it's this side of ludicrous. But one of uh, our Veronica's lab, you know, former, I guess, family, Jesse Coe did his PhD with Bruce Dunn and came and joined us, and he was very imbued with that K1, K2 uh, deconvolution. I said, no way. <laughs> We're not publishing a paper with that. So he went back in the literature and found ways to look at it from um, impedance. And this is based off work that Brian Conway and uh, his colleague published in the early 90s, trying to understand inductive effects in corroding systems. He just flipped it and looked at the capacitive part. So if we've got uh, pure capacitive response with our sodium electrolyte, you can see up here our uh, slowest 0.01 hertz frequency. We're looking at normalized capacitance. So this isn't a classic impedance plot. We're looking at it in 3D. Capacitance, the frequency, and the potential. So we can see the nice capacitive waterfall across the entire potential window. Now we're going to look at all zinc. Um, here's the 0.01 hertz. Again, you can see we're getting less in terms of real capacitance out of this system. And we get that feature that we would want to assign as a Faradayic response. So it is not as, shall we say, uh, electron communicative, even at these slower rates relative to the pure capacitive response. Here's the two to one. And here's our, our preferred one. You've got a lot of sodium and a little bit of zinc and you see how nicely you've blended in these two features. You're keeping the real capacitance high and you're putting in that Faradayic response, which is sort of hinted at here if you look at the capacity as a function of scan rate. The battery looks really good if you're, if you're just really slow, but then it's dropping precipitously, whereas the capacitor is less affected at these faster scan rates. So this is an innately hybrid material that you can access because of the ions in your electrolyte. So, there are other things to do, like let's go back to spinel, only instead of a lithium spinel, let's make a zinc spinel. Because there was this recognition that the zinc wasn't really inserting into the Berna site. But there is proper insertion into the spinel form. So Megan did the same thing we'd done with the lithium, exchanged out sodium for zinc, did the atmospheric treatments to form the zinc spinel and then did an ex situ study as, as you were in essence moving it and um, going to lower voltages in this case versus sink. So she would pop in and out and see things in between. So where you're here, where you've not done any 
um, zinc into um, out of the system if you've not discharged the battery. It looks like our classic nanofoam. But after we've taken it to 0.9 volts versus zinc, you see all of these uh, precipitates, which is the proton insertion into the burnocyte shifting the pH very basic at that electrified interface and you precipitate a zinc hydroxy sulfide. So it's never really been a zinc insertion. It's always been protonic based. And of course she did some of her exterior interior showing that yes, you make all of this salt, but when you come back to 1.75, you've cleared it out. And she likes cross sections. So you can see you've got that porous interior that looks like it's starting to fill. But then once you've come back to 1.9 in this case, it's gone away. So these are questions we can ask without a lot of the confounding implications of being in a powder composite electrode structure. And I wanna quickly finish on zinc. Um, we're pushing batteries for energy storage because we have to. We have to find ways to uh, take all the renewables out there and store the energy when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. But if we want that for our sustainable energy future, really shouldn't the batteries be sustainable as well? So Brandon Hopkins, who uh, finished his um, postdoc time with us about a year ago, took the European Union supply risk data for elements, where the EU has defined one as a you know, low supply risk. So that's the blue line coming across here. And then he plotted those numbers versus the abundance of those elements in the upper crust. And fortunately for us, a lot of the low supply risk abundant things are in that green lower right quadrant. And that's important for us because we really would like our batteries to be low supply risk and sustainable as well. And then Brian looked, Brandon looked at the system costs. So this is dollars per kilowatt hour of the system. And yes, your per cell lithium may look glorious, but when you put a lot of those together, you have to catastrophe management. So, you know, humans don't die and Teslas don't burn up, et cetera. And that adds weight and volume. So at that point, that lithium battery pack is a lot like a fuel cell. The, the guts of it are only a minor fraction of the weight and volume. So if you're looking at the system, you're going to say, well, gee, I've lost a lot. So here's in black lithium ion. Here's some of our old favorites, lead acid, nickel metal hydride. And then here's some of the things that do fall in our sustainable green area. And you can see in terms of low system costs and reasonable to great system energy, zinc's not a bad one to play with. So why zinc? Well, it's lithium ion competitive and if you get zinc air to be rechargeable, you're not gonna bother with lithium. In fact, I've, I've given briefings where I've said, if we had a clean sheet redesign of batteries, with what we know today in the 21st century, lithium would not make it on the page. So now we've got low cost, non-strategic materials. We're in aqueous electrolyte. You've got a sweeter spot for manufacturability. You've got safer operation. And the military loves zinc. In fact, they often use um, one shot discharge zinc airs to charge lithium batteries. But zinc systems are historically not very rechargeable. So when you bring our architected perspective and uh, up the scale a bit, not, now we're not tens of nanometers, we might be tens of microns back in the more standard battery size. Why would we want to be spongy? Well, we've got that co-continuous uh, ion um, electron path. It's scalable. You're talking to all of that surface close to open medium diffusion rates. That's a characteristic of these co-continuous four solid networks. You've got high surface to volume ratio. So even though we've got larger zinc than we were working with with the carbon nanofoam paper, we're getting hundreds of square centimeters of electrochemically addressable area in the volume of the electrode per square centimeter footprint. And what that does, in addition to wiring the electrons and wiring the ions, it lowers your, lo your local current density. And that's what causes a lot of problems in electrochemistry from electric deposition to electrowinning to batteries. You've got a modest electrifiable interface and you're trying to push a huge load on it. And so you push the current density to places where bad things happen. So just the physical change of our zinc from a foil or a powder has imposed morphological control because we've lowered local current density.
So here's our old picture of an active material. I'm not going to specify what it is, ground it up with carbon powder, some kind of separator, zinc is a powder. And as you discharge that in an aqueous, the end product is zinc oxide. There's some steps in between that complicate our lives. And so that zinc oxide is not highly conductive. So you start to passivate the metallic highly conductive zinc. And that part that isn't terribly passivated gets a lot of the local current density and that's why dendrites form. And they can be seen by eye and probably by satellite. So if you think in 3D, you're gonna take that powder and now fuse it into a sponge. So here's the cross section of the sponge. And now the zinc oxide is only going on the walls and you've always got a good metallic internal core that allows you to talk back to your macro scale current collector without any problems. So in our case, the sponge goes in, sponge comes out. And no big surprise, we've had lots of papers on that and uh, as you'll see some patents. So we first wanted to stress test the performance of the sponge just as you would for a lithium system to see when dendrites form under which electrolyte and which loads. And it's known for zinc and alkaline that's sort of in the ballpark of, you know, pick a number, six um, milliamps per square, which in the old day, you typically weren't trying to push your battery toward. In the modern day, yes. So we put a zinc versus a slightly zinc oxide coated sponge and just cycled it uh, twice the current, critical current density in an alkaline electrolyte. And that went on for three and a half days. Took it out, rinsed it off, put it in the um, scanning electron microscope. And you can see the exterior has uh, this nice sort of textured everywhere. You cross section, you see the same texture. And of course, most of the electrifiable interface is inside, not at that boundary face. And there's no loss of mechanical integrity, no shape change. That core shell, zinc oxide painted wall of the zinc sponge is giving us control. If you go to a finer um, scale, higher mag, you can see that each of these finely textured features looks like this little uh, spike. And that's why zinc wants to make a dendrite. If you get one of these kind of isolated from its neighbors and it's got all of the um, species you need to reduce to make zinc metal, you are gonna make a dendrite. And this taught us two things. You've got a confined volume in the pores. So you're going to supersaturate the soluble zincate that forms when you take divalent zinc as you discharge and it sees hydroxide in the electrolyte that will ultimately supersaturate and spit out water and make the zinc oxide. Now, if that zinc oxide doesn't go on the zinc, you'll never talk to it again. So this was telling us that now we've got a lot of uniformity in the system, a lot of neighbors, which on their own would definitely make a dendrite, but nobody wins out. They've all got to work well and play well together. So once you've solved the zinc dendrite problem, you know, you've got a lot of phase space to play in as this uh, shows from single uh, discharge zinc air to the rechargeable versus silver or nickel or um, manganese oxide, gold being a zinc air and ultimately an all solid state non-periodic 3D battery and even zinc, uh, the zinc ion. And I just, this is old work now published in science in 2017, but um, we showed that versus a rechargeable cathode, in this case, a commercially harvested nickel cathode, we could uh, get greater than 90% of all the zinc in that sponge oxidized and get almost all of it back. That's just a single charge discharge. Now, of course, in the battery, you're not trying to do that. So we had a one-year program from um, RPE where we had to demonstrate that we could eat 40% of all the zinc in the sponge as we discharge and get all of it back and do that for 100 cycles at um, a high load, 25 milliamps per square. And nobody's solid state electrolyte is going to do that. And we showed that. We did it in a year. And we also showed sponge goes in, sponge comes out. But we also wanted to look at another potential application space, and that's start-stop um, micro hybrids. And that's typically showing up in your more expensive cars, particularly in Europe, because sometimes you have to sit at a stoplight for two minutes and everything shuts off. So you need an engine restart and plus all these other things you're doing while the car is running. So most people don't publish operational duty cycles, even the military, but BMW published theirs. So we scaled it to the uh, cell we were working with, commercially harvested nickel cathodes versus our sponge and set that up and it went for four and a half months. So 
on the anomaly 20 cycles per day, that would have gone for six years. And currently those uh, start-stop microhybrids maybe last a year, even though they're rated for two. And again, sponge goes in, sponge comes out. So often we change things. The original science work was done with 20% of the sponge being zinc. And for an energy density um, normalization, that's not enough zinc. So uh, new postdoc from uh, Joe Parker's original work in the science paper, Jesse Ko came in and kicked it up to uh, 2.1 grams of zinc per cc of sponge. Joe was working with 1.4. And you just do a zinc air just to show you can eat most of the zinc. Sponge goes in, sponge comes out, and now it's coarse grayer because it's got zinc oxide. And now we're putting it versus a um, really homemade silver oxide because the military loves silver zinc. Uh, silver zinc kept the Apollo 13 astronaut, astronauts alive. There's some uses for it, although it's not gonna go in a car because people would be stealing batteries. So the same thing, you do a deep discharge, a deep recharge, you can um, see just how much you're working with. So that first generation of sponge, you've got 1.2 uh, kilowatt hours per kilogram of zinc, 1.5 kilowatt hours per liter of zinc. And as you might expect, if you go to a per gram normalization with the higher dense sponge, it comes pretty much to the same number, but where you win out is your per liter. And although I know we're used to thinking of specific capacities, uh, and worried about weight, for most applications, it really is the energy density you want. So just that reformulated sponge is just kicked it into a, a new phase space. The other thing we noticed with this more dense sponge, 30% of the sponge being zinc versus the silver, is we could now get 100 cycles and we were doing nothing to optimize the separator system and the silver cathode, which you need to do to even get tens of cycles. Our zinc um, gen one, two point, uh, the 1.4 grams per cc would give us 50 cycles without a problem. We were doing 100 with the new version. And then that was sort of like the um, smack in the head because of course, you have to think about how uniform is the current distribution between your two terminals. And if one electrode is misbehaving like zinc is making uh, dendrites, then the other electrode is trying to compensate for that now very irregular current distribution across the separator and the electrolyte. So if one electrode is being more uniform, you immediately take another electrode which is willing to act up and make it more uniform. So just that physical change in the zinc started to make even an unoptimized silver system behave. And now we're denser, we're stronger, we can thin it down, we can get higher power. So this just shows when you're putting, you know, from 15 to 500 milliamps across a square centimeter to um, <laughs> coin cell, to terminal coin cell, you can get up to uh, six watts per kilogram of zinc. So at this point, the system's really acting like a um, capacitor. And as we're making improvements in the zinc, uh, at some point, we're not gonna be able to talk about silver zinc publicly because then we start to go on the military critical list of performance. New postdoc, new protocol. Uh, Brandon recognized that our legacy uh, carboxymethylcellulose that we used to make the emulsion to make the zinc wasn't working when you upped the amount of zinc in the system. So he split the functionality. He worked with resin as a porogen and he worked with the food additive carboxymethylcellulose um, powder, not a resin, to uh, increase the viscosity and that let him get the amount of zinc up even higher than Jesse was able to work with the 2.1 grams per cc. So now we're at 2.8 grams per cc. He put it versus a harvested nickel cathode in our coin cells and he had designed his coin cell that he could remove the cathode part without really disrupting the separators or the zinc and replace the cathode, which he had to do because when he was starting to see any fade, he put in a fresh nickel cathode and it would kick right back up. So he did that four times. He was doing 40% of all the zinc being oxidized and recovered during the uh, charge cycle. And he got to 150 cycles, but he had to replace that cathode four times. Whereas the zinc was just doing backstrokes because it's saying, you know, throw, throw a better cathode at me, it could care. So in this cross section, you see, um, we've actually sliced one of the zinc um, cores and you can see how filled that is. On the map, you can see in the blue, the oxygen, you can see just how bright that is around the zinc core. 
and that helped verify and we've also done tomography to show it really is that uh, cartoon we showed it is a core shell so here's uh, the sort of reduced zinc it looks very plate-like before you start 150 cycles at 40 percent depth of discharge and that's theoretical that's not uh, a normative here's what i get 40 percent that's theoretical and then here's after 150 cycles so if you look at this on a uh, milliamp hours per volume in this case, cubic centimeters of zinc, you're just kicking whatever's in the literature in the teeth. And new postdoc, Ryan DeBlock, we're about to hire. Uh, he's tried to make this even faster and more scalable without um, it's giving you some control of how much zinc oxide is on the surface. So now he's got zinc powder, salt, acetic acid, water. You could get still keep the arbitrary shape construction we had with the emulsions. The heating is much shorter. Um, under nitrogen, you're, you're getting your bridges between the zinc particles without the elaborate treatment that we described in our first paper in 2014. And then you just remove, in this case, the porogen being uh, things like salt with water ethanol washing. So we're getting in that sort of nice uh, sweet range of two to three grams per cc, so 30, 40 uh, percent fill factor getting high capacity, and this can be done without having to electro-reduce any thermal oxide on the system. So here you can see 100 square centimeters of plate zinc that could go in a pouch cell, millimeter thick, or lots of things ready to go in a coin cell, or lots of cylinders ready to go into like double AA, A, triple A type form factors. And again, you know, very spongy. So the anode is fine. Well, I'm sure I'm at 30 minutes plus. Just a tiny bit over. <laughs> I want to make one more point. Now we've got to do work on the cathodes. So Brandon went back into the literature with everyone's sort of projected practical specific energy or energy density for state-of-the-art lithium ion, lithium sulfur, the approach to go to layered metal oxides versus lithium metal, the argon estimate of how, how <laughs> the best number you might get out of lithium air, and then zinc air. And of course, these orange ones are where we're caring about. It's that energy density. And of course, zinc is known for good uh, volumetric energy, and lithium is known to be very bad with respect to that. So why are we putting quite so much effort into lithium? And the fun thing about zinc air is you've got to do four electrochemical devices well. You've got to have the ability to reduce oxygen in an alkaline electrolyte, so it's like a fuel cell. You need pulse power, which typically air breathing cathodes don't give you, but we've got ways to get around that with architected designs. You have to have the zinc not make dendrites, solve that problem. And then at the end of the day, you have to evolve oxygen. So you have to have alkaline electrolyzer function. All of that's got to work in one nominal two terminal system. So we've come back to aerogels. We've made two types of catalysts, the cryptomolane tunnel structure, polymorph of manganese oxide, and a nickel ferrite, which is known to be a reasonable oxygen evolution catalyst. Cryptomolane is better for oxygen reduction. And if you've just, we've gone to powder composite because everybody else uses that when we compare our results. Just the manganese oxide, you can see you've got uh, a reasonable um, discharge cell voltage, but you've got to charge it well above two volts and carbon doesn't like to go there. Whereas if you're just looking at the nickel ferrite, it's got some bifunctionality. You're perhaps not getting quite as high a uh, initial discharge cell voltage as you like, but you keep the charge well under two volts. So put the two powders together into our part carbon composite and you get the best of both worlds. You buy back a better discharge cell voltage. You're keeping it below two volts to charge. And we're getting some of the highest power density out of a powder composite. That's, uh, we've gotten higher power density out of an architected one, but we're still making that work with uh, two types of catalysts in it. And this shows what happens with one alone, just the cryptomolane or the nickel ferrite. And the blue, of course, is the best of all words. You've got some of the lowest hysteresis values ever reported. And so here we are relative to what's in the literature. You know, even just the nickel ferrite alone is not bad on its own. And we never work with cobalt. All of these other ones are typically working with cobalt. And we are trying again to say low supply risk and sustainable. So be an architect. The, what you make may look like um, the dog's breakfast. It's not this periodic perfect array, but that's good for many, many reasons. 
and uh, Chinese wisdom to end. It's these empty spaces that make the room livable. While the tangible has advantages, it is the intangible that makes it useful. So we are big fans of the importance of nothing. And I thank you for the opportunity to kind of walk you through how we view energy storage in the aqueous electrolyte world. Thank you. Deborah, thank you so much for that overview um, of a great body of work uh, spanning quite, quite a long time. Really appreciate it. Um, we're a little bit over in time. So um, there are two questions I want to highlight here, Deborah. Uh, one is more on the fundamental side and one is more on the technology side. Th the fundamental question is, um, you talked about using materials like MnO2 and others without uh, conducted additives. Um, how how tunable are these materials in terms of uh, as electronic transport? And is that um, a, a, a key bottleneck as you uh, use them for your applications? Well, that's why I point out one of the huge open questions. Carbon is not anybody's choice as a fast electron transfer surface. Um, and we get away with what we get away with because we're so thin. So when you work with a carbon nanofoam, you're looking at four to 500 square meters per gram of electrifiable interface. Mm -hmm. So even 10 nanometer thick oxides on that surface gives you technologically relevant weight loadings. And how about just the bulk electronic transport in these materials, just to get it all the way through the thickness of the electrode? You don't have to worry about that because that 3D current collector scaffold is in good contact with the current collector. And of course, everything is happening originally at the current collector because you do have a little bit of that transmission line, mm -hmm. but it's not enough to interrupt you know, mm. the power in the system. So you know, the ideal in our view would be um, where we're working towards, which is that 3D tricontinuous non-periodic solid state battery, mm -hmm. which we originally proposed in the late 90s and wrote a chemical review article, the 3D battery architected uh, paper came out. The important thing about being non-periodic is it collapses to a uniform current distribution, particularly in that, that filled 3D tricontinuous design. The mm -hmm. anode and the cathode, we're going to want to have at most maybe 100 nanometers apart. Mm -hmm. And we, we showed with the aerogel we could do it, but we only had 20 nanometers of open space to work with. So our separator was only about seven nanometers thick. Mm -hmm. And then we interfilled with the other electrode. And that's like doing molecular electronics. Mm -hmm. So, well, be, so if you've got the, the right material as that original scaffold, you are always going to have good electronic communication throughout the entire structure. And that's what the zinc sponge shows. We have yet to make a zinc dendrite, putting an enormous amount of current on the system in the alkaline electrolyte. You have to worry about too much zinc being in there. So we, we keep it sort of not much over 40% of the volume is zinc because you run out of ions. In fact, Megan did a really nice paper on the manganese oxide coated nanofoam showing, do I want rate or do I want capacity? And there is a sweet spot in terms of the poor solid architecture. You can have too much surface area, too much active material, and you don't get enough ions to it to get a real rate performance out of it. You have to go really slow. And that's what happens if the pores get too small. So you really, you know, we've been learning as we go over the last 25 years. So all those lessons are sitting in our papers over the years. So here's where we go for rate. Here's where we go for capacity. Here's how we have morphological control by a uniform. The electrochemist will tell you no electrode is truly 100% uniform, but in these approaches, it's so much more uniform than anybody else's electrode. That's why we get away with what we get away with. Thank you, Deborah. Maybe as a segue to the second question on the technology side. So, you know, in the lithium ion battery field, as you mentioned, the, the dominant approach has been use carbon composites, uh, I'm saying the cathode side, in order to create the necessary electronic and ionic transport. And it's challenging from a morphology perspective. Um, you know, 3D current collector has also been explored, uh, but I think commercially, uh, cost has been a limiting factor. Do, do you right. also see that as a challenge uh, for the aqueous, or does the aqueous open up other uh, doors that the, um, the lithium ions do not? I think it opens doors, plus it makes manufacturing so much less uh, strenuous and onerous and expensive, because once you're working with lithium and even if you're in 
well-behaved non-aqueous electrolytes, you've got organics. So there, there's that aspect of it. But if you're taking that architected approach, and now it needs to be done over on the cathode side, mm -hmm. you really are, are buying a lot. We're doing work now to get more than one electron out of the nickel. If you want to think about grid storage, we want to get more than one electron out of the manganese. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the, the group at City University of New York is trying to do that because that would be a really sweet system. It would be a zinc manganese for microgrids or even larger grid scale storage. Um, zinc air could have a lot of implications, but that one is a lot farther away because you've got to get so many things right. But I see a way to get it right easier than with lithium air. But uh, we've noticed once we sort of showed that we couldn't make dendrites with zinc, we saw a lot of people trying to make their lithium systems um, 3D <laughs> to try to get around the lithium dendrite issues. Mm -hmm. So it, just, just that change of perspective, just as we had when we recognized ruthenium hydrous oxide was always a nanocomposite doing the two transport functions well, rather than trying to make a homogeneous material do both well, buys a lot of design freedom. All right, a quick and last question, volumetric energy density. Um, you've highlighted at the materials level, um, as you approach these um, uh, porous materials, um, how does that play into the overall electro level volumetric energy density? And is that a limiting factor um, for these uh, electro designs? So at the end of the day, may, they may be a touch thicker. So for a lot of what's getting done for EV with the company who's licensing our sponge, they still want the zinc to be about a millimeter thick because at the end of the day, you're going to need, you know, some real mass there to have the capacity. Um, the cathodes likely could get thinner if we can get more than one electron out of them. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing things that, again, if you're more uniformly uh, reactive with both electrodes because you're not making dendrites, you can get rid of some of the... Um, the weight and volume that exotic separators induce. So there should be ways to uh, buy back, you know, I might be a little bit thicker than a 50 micron foil, but I might just be a 70 micron piece of paper. Got it. So where you can maybe, you might lose some of the press density at the powder level, you'll gain it because you can go with a much thicker electrode. Um, and, and you've got all of that inner surface area accessible and talking back to the current collector. So the utilization is, is the other thing that you're getting out of this, and that's going to help with rate. Uh, the military finds that um, you can take the manufacturer spec for how much energy is sitting in that packaged battery, and when you're out in the field doing stuff with it, uh, you're not putting it on a low load and just letting it discharge. You're often asking for power out of it. And in the classic powder composite, and I'm sure you guys all know this extremely well, you start to do mechanical damage to the active material if you keep trying to get power out of it. So that ultimately saps how much energy you can get out of it because you've lost, if you will, communication to that stress drained active material. And that's not happening in our systems. Absolutely agreed. Um, Deborah, thank you so much again. Uh, let me uh, hand things off to, to E, who will introduce Veronica, and then we'll come back for a, a panel discussion. Thank you, Deborah. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Will. Well, thank you, Deborah. Um, let me just add a comment. You, you gave a great talk, and also uh, your past research, I would say, has been very highly influential uh, on me as well. So this 3D architecture has been quite amazing. I learned a lot over the years from, from your uh, research. Uh, now let me invite our next speaker, uh, Professor Veronica Augustine to, uh, to the stage. Let me do a brief introduction. Uh, Ver Veronica is currently an Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering at uh, North Carolina State University. She also served as the Associate Editor for the Journal of Materials Chemistry A and Materials Advances. Uh, she is a university faculty scholar in NC State. Uh, she has uh, won uh, many awards over the years, uh, including the uh, Department of Energy Early Career Award. And by the way, that's a very hard one to win, very prestigious, Sloan Research Fellowship.
Um, with that, uh, Veronica, I would like to invite you to the stage and tell us about what you have been working on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's really um, a great honor for me to be here this morning. Um, thank you to Will and me for the um, invitation. And it's also a pleasure to be in the same um, uh, uh, speaking seminar slot as, as uh, Dr. Deborah Rollison. So what I'm going to talk with you today is going to be a little bit more on the fundamental side. Um, our group has been doing a lot of work in understanding proton coupled electrochemical processes and metal oxides for energy storage and conversion. So given the, um, the 30 minute time slot, I wanted to give you kind of some short vignettes of how we look at these processes and the approaches that we take to investigate um, something that's very important for aqueous energy storage. A little bit more about my research group. Um, we broadly investigate the electrochemistry of materials for energy and environmental applications. We're located at NC State University in Raleigh. This is our centennial campus, um, not too far away from the downtown Raleigh, uh, showing the engineering buildings. Um, our group's core experimental expertise is in material synthesis, electrochemistry, as well as in situ operando characterization. So like many of us working in electrochemistry of materials, we really are keen to understand how these materials are behaving in their, um, in their actual environments. Um, we have a rather broad array of, of research, research topics that kind of really focus in on the fundamental aspects of materials in electrochemical systems from the proton coupled electron transfer that's relevant for today's talks, but also we're looking at things like CO2 adsorption, superionic conductivity. Um, a big theme is electrochemistry under confinement, and I'll touch upon that just a little bit today, as well as, of course, porous electrodes, since that's how we assemble materials for pretty much all energy and environmental applications. Um, a little bit about material science at NC State University, especially for those students looking for um, graduate research or postdoc opportunities. We have wonderful state-of-the-art materials characterization facilities from x-ray diffraction to transmission electron microscopy. We have many faculty and very diverse research topics in our department, and um, Raleigh is a pretty nice place to live. This is our research group here on the left, so if you're interested to hear more about our group or all the other wonderful groups at NC State, please check out our website. Um, the work that I'll share with you today is the outcome of the dissertation research of several students from my group. Um, Shelby Pillai, who's now working at Urbix on graphite materials, James Mitchell, who's now a postdoc scholar with Shannon Betcher in Oregon, Saeed Saeed and Mike Spencer, who are graduate students and going to be graduating in the next year or two. So look for them for if you're looking for postdocs, they would be fantastic. And Ruo Tsun Wang, who is a postdoc uh, with um, Yuri Gogotsi, as well as several postdoctoral fellows. Simon Fleischmann, who is now a group leader at Helmholtz Institute OWN, leading his own research group in Germany, and Janelle Fortunato, who's working with us still. Um, so, and also many collaborators, um, as well as funding from DOE, NSF, and uh, Sloan Foundation. So this is our group. Um, these are the fantastic people that I have the chance to work with each day. Okay, so the, the theme of my presentation is really on protons. Um, and so the to orient you with why we care about protons for energy storage, I wanted to just put up a couple of um, uh, uh, view graphs. The first is protons as charge carriers provide some unique benefits. They are obviously small. They have the smallest ionic radius of all these uh, uh, typical ions, anions and cations that would be considered as charge carriers for energy systems. Um, they're monovalent that also, and this makes them relatively mobile and easy to insert, particularly into materials. Um, they are sustainable, this is non-metallic, um, and they have this unique transport mechanism via hydrogen bonding, the Grotus mechanism in liquid water, for example. All these things make them interesting as charge carriers for energy storage systems. The other relevance is obviously that they are ubiquitous in aqueous electrolytes. Um, they can participate in multiple types of reactions, adsorption, insertion, and conversion processes. And I showed this um, uh, uh, a schematic from one of Deborah's uh, recent papers that showed that in a zinc ion containing electrolyte, when you take this uh, spinel material and you cycle it, the mechanism does not involve a multivalent cation insertion, but in, uh, it does involve a proton coupled reaction through a conversion type process to form something much more complex than, than originally uh, uh, thought in the, in the research. 
Um, the other th reason why we're interested in proton insertion in metal oxide specifically beyond energy storage has to do with some um, kind of frontier applications of these processes. For example, um, in uh, programmable resistors, tungsten oxide, the modulation of the conduct, the electronic conductivity of tungsten oxide upon proton insertion as, sh insertion as shown here um, can be used for these new kinds of electronic devices. Um, as well as um, using the, the proton acceptance and the proton donation capabilities of these materials to perform catalytic processes on their surfaces um, through proton coupled electron transfer. So there's really um, kind of a broad range of, of processes from energy storage, energy conversion um, towards even new applications like the ones illustrated here. So for my presentation today, um, we're going to be considering kind of the array of processes that can involve protons on the surfaces of metal oxides and take a look at two specific uh, examples. The first one is work that we've been doing in my group for a long time, which is the behavior of protons and hydrous metal oxides. The relevance of this is for energy storage. So we're looking at basically um, how th uh, these protons and electrons can be stored on surfaces or in the interlayers of materials. And then the second um, shorter story, because this is a storage X uh, series, is on these processes in metal oxide electrocatalysis, where some of these phenomena like proton adsorption or insertion appear to be influencing the surface reactions of protons. <clears throat> so the first story, protons and hydrous metal oxides for energy storage. It started off with our interest in understanding the role of ordered and confined water networks in crystalline tungsten oxide hydrates. So we saw in Deborah's presentation how hydrous ruthenium oxide behaves as this ideal um, capacitive material with very high specific capacitance, this continuous network of water molecules and conductive metal oxide particles. And so there's always an interest to find other materials perhaps that can be um, uh, lower cost that would exhibit similar phenomena. And so we took this approach of looking um, at a material that contains structural water molecules, but now it's a, it's a crystalline material. Um, the, the this tungsten oxide hydrates, these are the structures, the layered, uh, they're layered materials, as you can see on the left here, and we can go through several phase transitions within the hydrates, um, all the way to the anhydrous tungsten oxide. All three of these phases can undergo reversible proton and cation insertion, um, so they are all redox active. And the hypothesis that we came in for this research um, was aligned with what was in the in the literature, which is that proton insertion would be faster in this material because of the greatest transport of protons along the structural water network. This would be perhaps kind of an intuitive approach to thinking where the protons would go. Um, and that's why we would observe fast uh, proton insertion kinetics electrochemically. So this is work that really underpinned the, re the dissertation research of James Mitchell. Um, and we took a look at various form factors of hydrous tungsten oxide. Sometimes they were slurry electrodes, sometimes they were thin films. This is the result from the thin film study. And what we always saw was that proton insertion in our hydrous materials was more reversible than in the anhydrous tungsten oxide um, with better capacity to retention at fast scan rates. So because of the thin film nature of these electrodes, we could push them at extremely fast rates. So this is a cyclic voltammogram at 2000 millivolts per second. And we saw that at these rates, the hydrous materials were performing better um, than the anhydrous material. This was previously uh, observed in the literature and attributed to this Grotus transport uh, property of, of hydrous tungsten oxides. What we found though was something a little bit different. Um, first, I just want to make this note that um, if you can, uh, there's a strong coupling between the mechanical deformation of a material or a molecule and rate capabilities. So we know that electrochemical redox requires a change in bond length. So when ferrocene is oxidized to ferrocenium, one way that you could characterize that is because the iron carbon bonds will lengthen. In an extended solid, these electrochemical redox reactions lead to volume and or phase changes. So they're much more significant um, because of this extended nature of the, of the materials. And you can consider using the rate of mechanical deformation to provide insight on the electrochemical insertion kinetics. And this is kind of that fundamental coupling between the extent of charge storage, the extent of volume change, and the rate capability of the material. <clears throat> 
To probe this, we used operando AFM dilatometry. Um, this is an uh, ongoing effort with Nina Balki, who is now at NC State, and Wan Yu Tsai, who's at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where we um, basically performed, used the AFM tip as a dilatometer. It's tracking the deformation of a, of a drop cast electrode in the middle of this a, uh, AFM cell. We're able to apply electrochemical um, a stimulus or a bias to our electrode, to our entire electrode through globally through a potentiostat and then measure very locally its response. This is the cyclic voltammetry that we obtain. And so again, we see more reversible proton insertion for the hydrous materials and the anhydrous materials. This is what the surface topography looks like. And now what we're going to do is we're going to just land our AFM tip in the middle of these electrodes somewhere and then track how does that electrode respond um, when we're applying the cyclic voltammetry signal. And what we saw over and over again was that the hydrous material exhibits more reversible and smaller deformation. So the deformation magnitude for the same thickness uh, electrodes was always smaller for the hydrous material. Um, very notable, there was a lack of that hysteresis. So that's what we mean by reversibility. And there's also very little dependence of the deformation on, on scan rate as protons are cycling in and out of the material. So right away, we see that one of the big differences between these two materials has to do with how stable the structure appears during the proton insertion and deinsertion process. <laughs> um, furthermore, to kind of uh, uh, go back to that initial uh, statement that I made between the, um, the, the deformation of a, of a material or a molecule and its electrochemical response, we saw a, a direct correlation between the current and deformation rate. So if we take the derivative of the AFM data from the previous slide, we get the solid curve here with the error bars. Um, the dashed line is the electrochemical current coming from the entire electrode. And you can see we have extremely close agreement, um, except in the region where we have the onset of the hydrogen evolution reaction on the electrode surface, which is being measured from the, with the potential step, but which does not cause a volume change in the material and therefore does it register on the AFM tip. So we have this really nice technique to measure very locally the, um, the, the deformation of material and that can be applied to study, for example, the heterogeneity of the electrode deformation uh, across uh, the spatial heterogeneity of material deformation. Um, for, for our purposes here, though, it showcased that there was another aspect that we could consider for why the hydrous material showed more reversible proton insertion and it had to do with this structural response. Um, using operando x-ray diffraction, we were able to uh, further correlate this response to basically a more reversible electrochemically induced phase change. This is uh, operando x-ray diffraction performed uh, at SLAC by James Mitchell and Elisa Patterson in collaboration with Mike Tony's group. And what we observed at different scan rates is that the tungsten oxide hydrate always was showing this very reversible phase transition with proton insertion. Um, these are the electrochemical input. This is the current response. You can see that at the redox peaks, there's this very distinct transition of the hydrate um, into uh, an, an, uh, a new uh, a crystal phase. Um, there's no interlayer spacing change, however. So that idea that protons could be moving along these pathway, it doesn't, it's not really supported through the X-ray diffraction. What we can say is that we're not seeing tungsten oxygen bond distances change along that interlayer uh, axis. On the other hand, for the anhydrous tungsten oxide, which can also accommodate protons, what we see is a very uh, kind of sluggish phase transition process. The material never fully transforms to its next structure, the two phases are always present. And when we push it to operate at an even faster rate, we see that the hydrous material is able to keep up with the phase transition. Um, whereas the anhydrous tungsten oxide, the diffraction peaks appear uh, almost static, frozen, and um, there's no structural transition at this rate. So this led us to have a revised hypothesis for what's happening with these crystalline tungsten oxide hydrates. We don't see evidence of protons transporting along these water networks here. Um, they're more likely associated with the bridging oxygens within each of these layers. We do see evidence of structural transitions associated with the um, <laughs> changes in the tungsten oxide bond distances within this layer. So this is a top-down view on these layers. Um, and so that makes our hypothesis more that the structural water is providing structural stability during proton insertion. So it's essentially kind of like a glue keeping these layers together 
um, and not rearranging so much as in the case of the anhydrous tungsten oxide, you have more of a, a floppy crystal structure, if you will, where um, there's no um, reinforcement coming from the structural water network. So this was our kind of revised hypothesis, what's happening with protons in a crystalline uh, hydrate material. So with this work, we, we showed the kinetic benefit of structural water, but the capacity is very low. We not only are using tungsten here, but we also have a lot of structural water molecules. So that all kind of decreases the specific capacity. So we were on the hunt for maybe finding tungsten oxide hydrates that could have a better performance. And one route of doing this is to take um, uh, high temperature solid state materials and exchange their ions, interlayer ions by protons. And one approach is to take this bismuth tungsten oxide material, expose it to acid, and you form a material that looks very similar to what we were working with before, except now the water networks are separated from by each other by basically every two tungsten oxide layers. So this is a uh, different ways of writing this uh, formula. You can think of it as uh, hydrogen tungstate or W206.H2O, which shows kind of the relationship to what we were working with before. Um, the interesting thing is that now this material shows a much more potential dependent response for proton insertion, whereas before we had this much broader uh, response, we have a very specific potential dependence in the cyclic voltammogram. Um, and we did achieve our goal of having about two times the specific capacity of the uh, tungsten oxide monohydrate while maintaining very good rate capability. So that's the comparison with the blue, uh, with this material, the H2W207, and then the monohydrate down here. And then for the same particle size, we still see that the anhydrous material shows worse kinetics. So we were able to kind of use metastable uh, uh, transition metal oxides to improve the performance. Um, now, moving on to the next story, this is something that we've been working on for a few years, and um, we've had a lot of questions about this very basic uh, uh, kind of idea of, you know, where does the electric double layer end and intercalation begin? So we like to work with hydrous metal oxides in our group. The tungsten oxide hydrates were... Uh, saying that the protons don't appear to be moving along the structural water networks. But there are many other hydrous layered materials, for example, where they do accommodate cations inside of their structure. And so <clears throat> for, for the most part, when we think about um, the electric double layer, we're thinking about planar electrochemical interfaces. So when we think about processes like cation adsorption, um, we think about the, this distinction between the absorption of a fully solvated cation that would have a nonspecific interaction with the surface. So in the cyclic voltammogram, for example, you would see no specific potential dependence. And then you also have specific cation adsorption where there's a chemical bond that's being formed uh, with between the cation and the electrode surface, including either full or partial desolvation of the cation, and that would have an associated potential dependence with it. And in, a, in a, uh, these distinctions between these two processes, a fully solvated cation adsorption, non-specific, specific cation adsorption is essentially how we describe double layer non-Faraday capacitance and pseudocapacitance. But what happens when we have layered hydrous materials that have interlayers that either contain water molecules and cations or have a large interlayer spacing that can accommodate partially or even solely, fully solvated cations? Um, what happens in that in-between space between the outer surface and then the inner surface on the far right-hand side, which is a clear intercalation system? We were really interested in understanding what the behavior of materials like this should be described as, because there's a lot of discussion in the literature about what, um, what this is. Is this non-Faradaic? Is this Faradaic? So to look at this question, we went back to Bernicite, which we heard about in um, Deborah's presentation as well. It's a classic capacitive oxide material. And this is the work for, of, of Shelby Ply as well as Saeed Saeed. Um, so we made um, a Bernicite through electrodeposition. This is the, um, the kind of perfect crystal structure of Bernicite. The interlayer contains cations as well as water molecules. The interlayer spacing is about 0.7 nanometers. Um, and then the electrochemical response you see when we say capacitive, we mean that there's this very weak potential dependence. Most of the uh, capacity associated with this material is coming from um, a potential independent process. And the, this material is of interest for high power energy storage, desalination, as well as electrocatalysis. So really broad applications in aqueous energy systems. 
one of the things we wanted to understand is whether most of this capacitance was just coming from uh, outer surface processes, ion adsorption at the outer surface of this material. So what we did is this um, experiment that uh, we learned from, from Deborah's research, which is to take the burnicite and cycle it in a aqueous electrolyte that contained a small cation, um, relatively small cation like potassium, sulf potassium, as well as in a non-aqueous electrolyte that contained a bulky cation like tetrabutyl ammonium and compare the capacitive response. So tetrabutyl ammonium is, has a uh, ionic radius of 0.41 nanometers. It's actually used to exfoliate burnicite. And what we observed was that the capacitance is orders of magnitude greater in an aqueous electrolyte than in this non-aqueous electrolyte. So essentially what we see is that in the non-aqueous electrolyte, we must only have the outer surface adsorption process taking place, whereas in an aqueous electrolyte, we must have outer surface adsorption as well as intercalation coming into play as well. So we would estimate based on these results that that outer surface is contributing only uh, less than 10% to the total capacitance in the material. Another question, since we were working with potassium sulfate um, aqueous electrolyte, was whether protons are involved in the capacitive mechanism. So in this follow-up study, what we did is that we added a phosphate buffer to the electrolyte while maintaining a pH of 6.5. Now the phosphate buffer serves as a source of protons. Um, so there has to be a, a proton coupled electron transfer reaction taking place at the interface. We observed that as we increase the buffer concentration, there's an increase in the, um, in the, in the specific current of the electrode. However, this um, increase is very transient. It only occurs for the first uh, ten, few tens of cycles before the capacity degrades very significantly. Whereas if there's no buffer in the electrolyte, you get this uh, lower capacity, but much more stable cycling. So what we uh, observed here is that this film was basically dissolving when we had buffer present in the electrolyte. So protons did not contribute to the capacitive mechanism, this mechanism that we're talking about here uh, when there's no buffer present in the electrolyte. Um, combination of experimental and computational uh, studies um, led us to look at that, uh, what is happening structurally to the material and we observed um, this reversible interlayer breathing of burnicite, about a 1.4% interlayer change, which um, according to DFT simulations can be uh, the proposed mechanism is a counter movement of potassium ions and interlayer water molecules. The structural changes that we observed are gradual and the amount of charge transfer is relatively small and it involves uh, cations moving into the interlayer. So the question was, why does this cation intercalation appear capacitive or potential independent, whereas most cation intercalation does not uh, does have a very specific potential dependence? That is um, what we observe in batteries. So our hypothesis is that this has to do with the presence of those confined water molecules. These are reactive force field grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations by our collaborators at Penn State. Um, we uh, understand this uh, material as basically being uh, uh, very much dependent upon the nature of this interlayer environment. The cations like potassium, these gray spheres, are intercalating in the middle of the hydrous interlayer and they're coordinated by other water molecules within the interlayer. Their locations are nonspecific, so they distribute randomly in the interlayer, and that's why you would see a lack of potential dependence. And there's very importantly, very little structural change that takes place because you have this counter movement of water molecules or water molecules that again remain as kind of pillaring molecules within the interlayer. Um, this uh, uh, understanding this material has led us to uh, write a perspective in nature energy that was led by Simon Fleischman um, published earlier this year where we uh, you know, tried to again go th about this argument thinking about what happens as the interlayer spacing changes or the interaction distance between an electrolyte species and the host materials increasing and how we can think about this as kind of this continuum from outer uh, surface uh, uh, adsorption processes towards intercalation. Okay, um, now for the second part, um, of, of the discussion, which is how these dynamic proton processes and metal oxides could affect electrocatalysts. So um, ion insertion can lead to dynamic changes in metal oxide materials. You can think of this as an example of how the confinement of electrolyte species is affecting 
uh, electrochemical reactivity. There's also really nice work from Will's group uh, published last year on this, uh, uh, on this phenomenon in cobalt hydroxide. And what we're observing here, uh, or what we decided to study in our group, is to use a materials chemistry approach to see if we can um, we can trigger basically the proton insertion either on or off and see what happens to uh, the catalytic process on the surface. So this is work uh, done by Mike Spencer, where we make these transition metal oxide organic hybrid materials. Um, we basically have uh, oxide layers separated by organic pillar molecules. These organic pillar molecules can take on different different forms, and they have some nice tunable properties. The biggest one is interlayer spacing, um, but that can also be, you can also affect the transition metal coordination, ion transport pathways, and so on. This is what the materials look like. Um, in particular, we used our, our, our friend, the tungsten oxide monohydrate. You expose it to octylamine and heptane, and there's a dissolution reassembly process. So it's not just a ion exchange, but there's material actually dissolves and then reassembles with the octylamine in between the layers. And we can see that through the change in the microstructure on the SEM from the nanoscale morphology of the monohydrate to the micron scale octylamine containing material. Um, then you can, if you expose this material to sulfuric acid, then a, an ion exchange process does take place and you form the dihydrate form of the, of the material, but in a micron scale. So now we have um, several materials that we can use to probe how proton insertion affects the hydrogen evolution reaction taking place on the surface. The first thing we note is that with these octylamine containing materials, we suppress proton and cation insertion. So whereas protons and small ions like lithium ions can insert into tungsten oxide monohydrate, once we have octylamine in the interlayer, we basically stop those from intercalating. And both materials are not able to intercalate a bulky catalytic tetrabutyl ammonium. Um, then when we look at the, um, uh, the, the hydrogen evolution reaction uh, of phenomenon, we see that for <clears throat> the octylamine material, it has the highest overpotential for the HER. And we can further uh, express this uh, by taking the overpotential at a specific current um, uh, at five milliamps per square centimeter and plotting it by the number of electrons associated with each tungsten. And we see that the highest overpotential is with that octylamine material. And then as we start to um, insert more and more protons into the structure, that overpotential decreases very quickly. So the open question is still exactly why proton insertion influences HER activity. Um, one idea that's been around for a very long time is that the proton insertion changes the electronic conductivity, like the work that I showed you at the very beginning from the yieldist group, um, tungsten oxide will go from a semiconductor to metal transition. Um, in thin film materials, though, we would assume that the uh, electronic conductivity is, is relatively good. Um, another hypothesis more recent comes from our collaborators in the McCone group, where um, they have evidence that proton insertion actually changes the uh, absorption free energy for, for protons for the HER. Um, and then something else that could potentially be taking place is if these inserted or bulk protons are actually participating in the, in the HER at these surface active sites. So these are some uh, hypotheses that we're testing out and, and still kind of to be determined for this class of materials. But we've shown definitively that the proton insertion must take place in order for the tungsten oxide surface to be catalytically active. Okay, so with that, um, I've given you a brief overview of our group's work in proton coupled electrochemical processes and metal oxides. Um, there's a range of phenomena that can take place from proton adsorption and insertion, hydrogen evolution reaction, as well as conversion or dissolution reactions. So the behavior of protons in these systems is can be complex and very dynamic. But um, if we can harness them, it can obviously make a big impact on energy and environmental applications. I'd like to acknowledge um, all the folks that have worked on this research once again in my group, as well as our collaborators and then support of the funding agencies. And um, with that, I think we have time for discussion. I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much, Veronica. So a very nice uh, presentation. Um, two, two directions highly correlated. Um, I'm so glad to see these um, intercalations 
you know, you go very deep into the proton um, couple uh, of uh, this energy storage. Um, <clears throat> so what one question um, relates to the first topic. So this is crystalline water sitting between the layers. Um, how dynamic is are those water molecules? I mean, they're bonded between the layers. Once iron comes <laughs> in, Right. So is there now understanding to know how dynamics um, are those water molecules? Are they kind of just sitting in the same sites? You know, do they change orientation? Do they kind right. of just... That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, great, that's a great question. Um, in uh, James's paper, we published in ACS Energy Letters a couple of years ago now, we performed quasi-elastic neutron scattering of these materials, um, the, the hydrates in particular. And this structural water molecules in these materials is confined. There's no translational motion of water here. So um, you could use the term ice-like for these crystalline hydrates. This water is not very mobile. Hmm. But in other um, materials, we put, have not performed the quasi-elastic neutron scattering in burnicite, but in other materials, I would assume in, in burnicite, I think is an example that you could see translational motion. Of, of the water, but in these particular materials, we do not. So, uh, so Veronica, if uh, water doesn't move, um, these uh, hypothesis of uh, growth type of transport, would that be still happening? Uh, or, um, you know, what's, what, what's the thing <laughs> right here? Yeah. So the, yeah, so the Grotus transport does not require translational motion of the water molecule, right? It just requires yeah. the, the movement of the proton. Um, so when we started the work, we thought maybe we would see something like that. But I would say there's there's two things. You, other than this slide, you do not see the word Grotus transport in my the remainder of my presentation. Um, because Grotus transport is specifically talking about the motion of only a proton. We know in these systems, we're talking about proton coupled electrons, right? The, the proton and the electron are coupled. We're talking about an electrochemical system. So mm -hmm. um, even if water was moving through these structural water networks, which we don't have any evidence for in the tungsten oxides, I would still not call it a Grotus transport mechanism because of that electron association that has to be present. Um, so um, so that's that's what we see in our work. Um, yeah, and, and the, the typical ways that you see in the literature of, of, of looking at for like a Grotus transport mechanism is to take a pellet of the metal oxide and measure the activation energy um, uh, from looking at the temperature dependence of the conductivity, right? Um, and you can, and if your activation energy is is low, you know, less than 0.4 EVs per atom or something like that, people say, well, this is a very small activation energy, therefore you must have Grotus transport mechanism. But in these hydrous oxides, um, two issues. One is that there's a lot of water on the surface, so what you're probably measuring from those pellets is that surface. Uh, the protons transporting along the surface. And then the second thing is what I mentioned here, which is we're talking in the electrochemical insertion of a proton that's coupled to an electron. And, and that's very different from Grotus mechanism of protons in an acid electrolyte. Yeah, so, so uh, maybe just a, just a little bit for follow up on this. Do you need a little bit of motion of water, even though it's not translation, right? So, um, I think a proton coming in jump just kind of relay. Uh, I think it's their motion. I seem to remember. I haven't. I revealed the growth of mechanism for a long right, time. Whether right. you need a tiny rotation or not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a slight kind of rotation of water yeah. molecules that takes place, and that could be happening within these materials. Um, yeah. We we would not be able to probe that through the quasi elastic neutron scattering. That length scale is just very tiny. So what we know for sure is there's no translational motion. The water molecules themselves are not translating through. Them. It looks like the hydrogen bonding network within these crystalline tungsten oxides is yeah. basically keeping the water in relatively fixed positions. 
Yeah, I mean, this is fascinating. This reminds me uh, uh, for about a decade, uh, my lab works on uh, Prussian blue type of open framework material. There's also crystalline water in right, there. Right. Turned out to be sodium and potassium. All this iron going in is just so fast. So allow yeah. you to do very, very fast charging. This right, charging. right, right. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it is a fascinating topic. And I'm sure you've seen the work from um, Jule uh, G at Oregon State. Um, yeah. his work with Prussian blues. Um, yeah, like from 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 where we are right now with understanding these materials, I see we have evidence that the structural water network is playing more of a pillaring role mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. a uh, proton transport network role. And okay. that seems to be the key for their rate capability. Yeah, that's great. Um, second question uh, is related to your second topic. Um, when you have iron insertion into these layer materials. So I was thinking about what could be the reason, right? Change the HER activity. Um, there, there could be multiple factors right there and see what's your thought. Uh, once proton coming in, first of all, uh, the tungsten oxidation state is changing slightly depending on how much proton you have. And if an oxidation state, the binding energy that will influence with the proton absorption, that's probably what you refer to in one of the papers. Mm -hmm. right? Yep, yep. James's, yeah. uh, James McCone's group published that work around the same time that we published our results. So it's very nice to see. Yeah, yeah. So it is a, a, a analog analogous uh, material system of tungsten oxide. It's actually molysulfide. Uh, Molly sulfide in the, about a decade long. So the study is showing um, if you took like lithium, for example, you change the layer spacing, you change the moly uh, oxidation state as well. You probably change the edge size, the defect states as well. So it's very complex. Mm -hmm. That actually made the HER become so much more active after you change that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other side, on the OER side, something like lithium cobalt oxide, all these layer materials, you, you do lithium in and out. Uh, actually, my lab looked into that a while back. You change your OER activity as well. This is actually coupled together with certain oxidation state change, electronic structure change. So is the, um, this binding energy intermediate state, uh, it will be the main mechanism. I'm thinking whether there's also other things going on, it will be good to see <laughs> pick your brain a little bit, yeah. Right, I mean, I think what's interesting in general about this research is that we, we have to think about it both from a very molecular under, level understanding, like when we talk about what's the oxidation state of the metal, um, but we're also talking about extended solids. So in a tungsten oxide, for example, when it's inserting protons, the electrons become delocalized, right? We're talking about a metallic mm -hmm. conductor at that point. Yeah. So yeah. it's that interplay between thinking about the molecular, like active site perspective, and then the extended solid perspective, what's important, you know, what's the actual descriptor. Um, I think it's very interesting in, in this research. Um, I would say for, for what we've shown so far with our work, uh, it's really just the first kind of definitive example that if that insertion doesn't take place, then mm -hmm. for sure, you're not gonna have a good catalyst because maybe, you know, until you can actually trigger that off, you might say, well, it might've happened anyway. You know, you might've, still had the HER take place anyway, or the OER take place anyway, even without that, whatever is happening to the active material, whatever is taking place on the surface would have still happened. But now we were able to trigger that process off and we see, no, it will not happen in that same manner. Um, so that's where we are with that work. Um, we have ongoing studies to understand the full breadth of structural transitions that are taking place in the tungsten oxide systems. Um, there's a number of structural transitions that are that take place when tungsten oxide or the hydrous tungsten oxides insert protons. Um, we're really interested in what's happening exactly at that point where the HER occurs. Um, and I don't have definitive answers for you yet on the topic, at least from the tungsten oxide perspective. But yeah, there's a lot of very interesting work showing how dynamic these materials are and how the material that you place into the electrolyte is not the activated material that you have at the point of the 
catalytic reaction. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Veronica's third question is uh, now coming back to the energy storage of uh, you know, proton base. Um, so I, I I look at the proton system. You know, once you store proton, uh, if I I compare this uh, with lithium ion battery, lithium ion battery is a kind of rocking chair mechanism. Um, so the electrolyte composition, the lithium concentration is fixed because lithium coming in and then going out, so it's balanced. Uh, I myself also work on the aqueous system for for a while. So oftentimes, um, when you insert proton somewhere, it's better it will have a proton coming out from some <laughs> from the opposite electron, so you balance that. So we often face a situation of uh, pH is changing if it's not balanced. Uh, mm -hmm. Just pick your thought a little bit. So, and, and this may be for Deborah as well. I mean, this as a brainstorming, like for mm -hmm. the whole research field. How, how do we um, really design the whole full electrochemical uh, cell that could uh, benefit uh, of uh, having a fixed pH? So what we what would be a good pair? Uh, but it doesn't mean if pH is not you know, balance, it will not work. Let acid batteries, right? It's uh, absolutely, this the proton concentration is changing. That's why they use very high, very strong uh, uh, sulfuric acid, right? And to make sure the change is minimum. Uh, so it's uh, just generally, what's your thought? I mean, this question has been in my mind for a long time. You know, when we pick right. a system, you know, can we really find a, a, a great system for particularly now we talk about proton couple? Uh, the lack of chance for the for the storage. I mean, this pH change will probably start to show up. Yeah. Right. Right. So we we work in the tungsten oxides case. We're talking about you know 0.5 molar or even one molar sulfuric acid. But from the more cell level perspective, I would love to hear Deborah's perspective um, because we haven't done much work in that in that arena. Yeah. To me, it's we also had to think about the activity of free water in the aqueous world. And I'm, I bet it even bites us a bit in the non-aqueous world because there is always water around. I mean, the, the mild electrolyte case of the zinc ion is showing the problem because of the uh, electron insertion at the cathode uh, also is accompanied by a proton rather than the divalent zinc. You've got a huge shift in pH at that interface. And just as, as you showed, pointed out in lead acid, you've got high sulfuric in the alkaline systems, it's very high alkaline, mm -hmm. but that activity of water still matters. So if you um, bring in something that helps sop up water, like a, you know we've looked at mixed potassium, lithium, high alkaline concentrations, and the lithium needs so many waters of hydration to screen mm -hmm. its charge that you've lowered the, um, the activity of free water. You, you really can't corrode unless you've got a reasonably high activity of free water. So I think there are things we need to, we, we forget the water part of some of this. And if we really want the mild electrolyte systems to work, then some of what Veronica is teaching us with respect to buffers also needs to be brought back in. We're gonna be talking about how do you control the pH of that interface without, um, in essence, killing rate. I mean, to me, the modern energy storage system, if it's not giving you rate, its uh, application space is very small, which is my prime concern with the solid state electrolytes. If the best it can do is one to maybe three milliamps per square, anybody who says they're looking at it for electric vehicles really should get out of business. Highly appreciate that, Deborah. Um, uh, we're free to chime in anytime as well. This is a good uh, leeway to our uh, panel discussion. Um, so yeah, Deborah, this is this is fantastic. I think the the water one uh, activity is very important. So you mentioned this lithium coordination with water molecule. This is a, a great direction to to go. And also, perhaps I, I would just add in. Maybe we want to think about the kind of divalent ion that tied up the molecules, uh, water molecules even more, uh, because of its high, the charge is high, and also perhaps the direction of uh, water and salt, uh, <laughs> that uh, also tied up the activity. 
of the uh, water molecules. I, yeah, I would. I just want to add one thing about the 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 role of buffers and aqueous electrolytes, Deborah. I appreciate that you say I, I'm teaching you that because I'm learning a lot about this myself um, from the the P set field, from the proton coupled electron transfer field. Um, the idea that you don't just need to look for a free proton in an aqueous electrolyte, but you can find proton donors from other kinds of molecules, even in non-aqueous systems, I think can be very powerful for um, any sorts of energy or uh, storage or, or conversion reactions that we're thinking of involving protons. Um, I always kind of came in with this idea, we're talking about hard acids, you know, strong acids, strong bases, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, you can utilize other um, uh, or sources of protons. It does add an additional kinetic step of a proton transfer that has to occur at the interface, but that process can be faster than you know some of the, the for example, structural transitions that might be taking place in your material um, subsequent the proton donation. Yeah. Will, would you like to uh, chime in here for discussion? Yeah, absolutely. And Veronica, let me add my thanks uh, to a great talk. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we constantly think about is the relative rates of surface reactions um, at the electrolyte, electrolyte, electrode electrolyte interface and also bulk transport, right? Um, and this, of course, also, as you have known many times in your work, determines whether the material is more battery like, more pseudo capacitive. So in, in systems in which you have a lot of um, um, water uh, insertion, uh, like um, tungsten trioxide, um, do you have a general sense what its bulk transport properties are like? So we don't, in the tungsten oxide hydrates and the, um, and the anhydrous tungsten oxide, there's no water co-insertion taking place. There's no solvent co-insertion insertion taking place whatsoever. Uh, from our investigations, the rate limiting steps appear to be the solid state structural transitions and not mass transport effects. Um, that's the primary differences that we see between their responses, but we do not have a bulk uh, diffusivity measurement for protons or, or lithium ions even in, in these systems yet. That's something that we are working on, however. Right. So, Veronica, I think what I'm trying to get at is I think a lot of these materials are somewhat nanostructure, right? So the diffusion length is, is short, but as you say, it doesn't seem to be limiting. So is then their potential to make them more macro scale, which could help in other respects? Um, and I'm also trying to get to a better understanding of at what scale does diffusion become a problem? Is it really so facile or is it more the reflection that the nanostructure has prevented the material to be mass transport limited in the bulk? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, um, in the case of the hydrates, we're not really able to play around very much with the particle size. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the typical way that you would increase particle size would be through sintering or grain growth. And when we do that, the structural water will be removed. Um, based on uh, estimates from the literature, and I honestly don't have that number off the top of my head for protons or lithium ions in the in the double in WO3, for example, as you say, the diffusion length scale is uh, much uh, greater than the particle size. So we don't see that mass transfer limitation. Um, I would say, you know, based on on your work as well as some other work uh, uh, from from groups um, studying, you know, single particle intercalation or, or porous electrode intercalation. Um, it, it doesn't appear as if solid state diffusion within a single particle is ever really a problem for lithium ions or protons. Um, and so that's why for us, it kind of makes sense that what is the limiting factor is the structural rearrangement that has to take place. Um, that requires more you know, energy, that requires more time, than a hopping mechanism for a small cation in a 200 nanometer particle or even smaller length scale film. Yeah, though, no, yeah, we, we definitely think diffusion is, is it's faster than most people think in the solid. Um, it's just, it's hard to tell whether it's a reaction limited process versus diffusion. 
Uh, maybe I can also shift gears a little bit since we only have 10 minutes left. Uh, uh, Eve, Veronica, and, and Deborah, um, you know, you have served roles in in in, in journal um, editing and so forth, and, and myself too. And one thing I have noticed, uh, which is very interesting, is there always seem to be great performance on aqueous uh, batteries, wh whether it's zinc or something else. So I thought maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of um, tricks you can do to improve um, um, the apparent cycle life of batteries or rate capabilities, um, because the literature reports are really all over the place. So I'm really curious for your thoughts on sort of what are some of the, uh, the, the ways to uh, uh, really reveal the true properties of the material rather than be controlled by you know, the um, low mass loading and so forth. I thought this would be, might be an interesting discussion for the, for the broader community to how to read you know, yet another 10,000, 100,000 cycle life um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll I have an answer. I I, I mean I'd love to hear uh, Deborah's and you use response first though. You can go first. <laughs> uh, we're wasting everybody's time and again the research budget of the United States because we haven't imposed proper metrics, either by the PI being unaware or wanting their work to look better than it is, and the journal editors are not in essence saying I'm sorry you. You're giving us something that is is barely moving the needle, and that's a huge problem in in almost any energy storage area. We're working on a diatribe for zinc air because, with all of the various electric catalysts out there for rechargeable zinc air, because no one is really pushing the aerial um, current per square, you have no way to say, okay, let's down select this type of electric catalyst and play with composition and structure and other things. So we're actually <laughs> impeding our ability to move the needle with respect to the performance of these real systems. Same thing is true, as you pointed out, with respect to the mass loading. Many things look great on a, a milligram per square. But if you're in the real world, that needs to be at least an order of magnitude higher. And, and we're actually coming up with this, trying to improve the number of electrons out of nickel. If you're working in a powder composite system, there are so many other contributions, even in the aqueous system, to um, that sort of early current you see, your capacity. You can't really say, is this due to that transition metal center or not? Whereas when we're in the architecture, we start to lose all of that sort of fade you can have rock stable response, even moving beyond a milligram per square. So part of our problem is the electrode structure is, is not, it's so convolved, it's hard for us to really find the right knob to turn, the right button to push. And, and that's what we're trying to get around because we really need to get more than one electron out of our transition metals on the cathode side because then there really is no reason to, to play with lithium at all in the standard lithium metal or lithium ion world. So yeah, I would love to see some rigorous metrics in that you have to have this loading or you have to have this aerial energy density or get out of here if you're only doing, uh, you're not really counting all your atoms, for instance. So at that point, then it's gonna be a lot cleaner on how we really improve our understanding of the materials of the electrode structure. And that will seamlessly move into better performing batteries and capacitors and electric catalysts. So, yeah. I try <laughs> that will, I resonate with you uh, about what, what your comment, particularly on the uh, power. So, so Will, let me uh, 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 just share some of my thoughts. Right? So uh, serving as editor for a while now, uh, the performance done by academia, I call it general academia means it's really in the research level, not, not in the industry deliver that the product level. Uh, so one has to be certainly very cautious about this performance reporting, particularly Deborah point out the power density, and particularly power density when you measure by C rate instead of the real current, how many million per centimeter square, this mass loading issue start to come up. So every time people talk about power, if I read the paper, I'll just look at what's the mass loading, capacity loading first. <laughs> um, but these other, parameters, they, they, they're different. For example, if you look at the capacity, uh, 
uh, million mile per gram or Faraday per, per gram. Uh, and the slow rate, this is uh, more of towards the intrinsic materials property. There's still value right there when, when you talk about performance of uh, capacity. But when people talk about energy density, now this comes back again. Uh, and you will measure a while per kilogram in the battery field. And this highly related to your mass loading also, as well as I also see uh, authors make a lot of mistakes. They will take the charging voltage as the energy density they could take. Because uh, charging, when you discharge, if voltage hysteresis is very big, your discharge voltage is very small, your actual energy density is very low. Uh, this mistake right there, in, uh, not, not just one paper, actually quite a large number of paper, particularly for the material system with a large hysteresis. Uh, and I can go on and on probably on, on the common on each parameters. Some parameters, I would say having the value, research value for people to understand, but I agree with Deborah. There's probably some, um, I would say, uh, um, the best of uh, practice needed. Uh, uh, to recommend uh, when people report their, their, their data, yeah, conduct their experiments. Um, I, I agree, <laughs> of course, with what Deborah and Yi are saying. I'm relatively new in the role of a associate editor at JMCA. Um, I have kind of two answers. One is kind of a philosophy um, that I heard from, from Adam Heller when I was a postdoc at UT Austin. I went to talk to him a little bit about, you know, research directions and things like that. And he he wrote to me something in an email that still kind of sticks to me. And, and I just looked up the email. So I'm going to quote directly what he told me when I asked him about what research should I do when I'm a professor. And he said, my advice is that you contribute the best you can to uncovering new truths and keep away from the graveyards of the thousands of useless quasi-applied devices unless you are willing to persevere and carry particular device through its development and its making into a society-relevant product. And I think that kind of thinking, you know, it was sobering for me, right? It was like, if you're just going to make, like, here I put these two things together and it lights an LED. Um, that's not that, <laughs> that's that graveyard of you know quasi useless applied devices. What's the fundamental truth that you're uncovering? Or if you're going to be making these devices, let's hope that your goal is to continue improving upon them to the point that it actually becomes a society relevant product. That's kind of on the research philosophy side. Um, and then uh, as an associate editor, I think that having the community write um, perspectives and, and, you know, say, here's what we think, here's, you know, taking this dialogue and translating it into a perspective that maybe provides useful metrics of ways of thinking about is very useful, especially as the field of research grows. And we've all seen how electrochemistry has really taken off over the past 20 years, right? I remember when Bruce Dunn told me you're going to study electrochemistry in 2007. And I was like, what the hell is he talking about? I was going to do biomaterials and enzyme encapsulation in his group. <laughs> he told me, no, you're doing electrochemistry. And now it's, you know, the, the topic that makes so perfect sense for sustainable energy. So I think because we have a huge global community, we really need these. I learn a lot as an, as an editor, what people are thinking from that. Um, not everybody may be in a particular meeting or in a particular symposium to hear some of this, especially after the pandemic. So having that is very useful and you are welcome to submit it to JMCA anytime. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. What a great note to end on. Um, I, I just want to also just maybe share my own thought on this. Um, I think electrochemistry is a low cost scientific field to get into. You don't need much, you don't need big vacuum chambers and you can do good electrochemistry. But as a result of that, I think less care gets into it because it's so easily initiated. Uh, so I completely agree with everything said here that the community as a whole needs to care more about benchmarking in order to have the result collectively push the field forward, Deborah, as you pointed out. So I think this is a great message for everyone uh, listening to your talk today. Um, it is a really great pleasure to host you both, Deborah Varnake and uh, Ian and I um, are wish everyone um, happy holidays. Um, this will be our last seminar for the year and we'll resume uh, middle of January 
And um, as a reminder, all of our recordings will be posted at the end of the quarter. Uh, so the, these recordings from this quarter will be posted in January. So please keep up with all the content um, and all the great talks that we're getting uh, from speakers participating in our symposium. And with that, um, happy holidays. Um, see you all happy next year. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, E. Happy holidays. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Veronica. Happy holidays.